do also defines who we are, determines our future prospects, dictates where and with whom we spend most of our time, mediates our sense of self-worth, molds many of our values, and orients our political loyalties. So much so that we sing the praises of strivers, decry the laziness of shirkers, and the goal of universal employment remains a mantra for politicians of all stripes. Beneath this lies the conviction that we are genetically hardwired to work and that our species' destiny has been shaped by a unique convergence of purposefulness, intelligence and industriousness that has enabled us to build societies that are so much more than the sum of their parts. Our anxieties about an automated future contrast with the optimism of many thinkers and dreamers who, ever since the first stirrings of the Industrial Revolution, believed that automation was the key that would unlock an economic utopia. People like Adam Smith, the founding father of economics, who in 1776 sung the praises of the very pretty machines that he believed would in time facilitate and abridge labour. Or Oscar Wilde, who a century later fantasised about a future in which machinery will be doing all the necessary and unpleasant work. But none made the case as comprehensively as the 20th century's most influential economist, John Maynard Keynes. He predicted in 1930 that by the early 21st century, capital growth, improving productivity and technological advances should have brought us to the foothills of an economic, promised land in which everybody's basic needs were easily satisfied and where, as a result, nobody worked more than 15 hours in a week. We passed the productivity and capital growth thresholds Keynes calculated would need to be met to get there some decades ago. Most of us still work just as hard as our grandparents and great-grandparents did, and our governments remain as fixated on economic growth and employment creation as at any point in our recent history. More than this, with private and state pension funds groaning under the weight of their obligations to increasingly aged populations, many of us are expected to work almost a decade longer than we did half a century ago. And despite unprecedented advances in technology and productivity in some of the world's most advanced economies, like Japan and South Korea, Hundreds of avoidable deaths every year are now officially accredited to people logging eye-watering levels of overtime. Humankind, it seems, is not yet ready to claim its collective pension. Understanding why requires recognising that our relationship with work is far more interesting and involved than most traditional economists would have us believe. Keynes believed that reaching his economic promised land would be our species' most singular achievement because we will have done nothing less than solve what he described as the most pressing problem of the human race from the beginnings of life in its most primitive form. The pressing problem Keynes had in mind was what classical economists referred to as the economic problem, and sometimes also as the problem of scarcity. It holds that we are rational creatures cursed with insatiable appetites, and that because there are simply not enough resources to satisfy everybody's wants, everything is scarce. The idea that we have infinite wants, but that all resources are limited, sits at the beating heart of the definition of economics, as the study of how people allocate scarce resources to meet their needs and desires. It also anchors our markets, financial, employment and monetary systems. To economists, then, scarcity is what drives us to work.